Hello, fellow foodies. Welcome back, and thanks so much for tuning in for season four of Foodie Pharmacology, the science podcast for the food curious. We've talked a lot about the topics of food security and food choice on the show, and I think most of you will agree that it can be kind of hard to navigate the modern food system and keep a healthy diet. But have you ever considered if some of our food decisions are beyond our control? And could certain foods be engineered to be addictive, like drugs or alcohol? And how complicit is the food industry in creating and marketing such foods? We're going to cover these topics and more today with our very special guest, Pulitzer Prize winning and best-selling author, Michael Moss. So let's tell you a little bit about our guest. Michael Moss is the author of Salt, Sugar, Fat, How the Food Giants Hooked Us, which is an expose of processed food and a number one New York Times bestseller published in 2013 with Random House. And his newest book published in 2021 is Hooked, Food, Free Will, and How the Food Giants Exploit Our Addictions, also a New York Times bestseller. Um, Michael is a former investigative reporter with the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, and he also won the Pulitzer Prize for explanatory reporting in 2010 for his work on contaminated meat. Michael, I'm a huge, huge fan of your writing. I've actually used your book, Salt, Sugar, Fat, um, in my course on food and health at Emory, and it's such a tremendous pleasure to meet you today. That's so great. Thanks for having me. I, 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 this is going to be really fun. Yeah. So we'll just go ahead and dive in. I guess to start with, maybe you could tell us a little bit about how you came to start reporting on the processed food industry. Well, speaking of Emory, some of my reporting background was working for the Journal Constitution in Atlanta. Right? Okay, I was great. Years and, then, and then I made the terrible mistake and left and, and went to New York. But um, and as you mentioned, I worked for the Journal and the the Times, and I was I was working as an investigative reporter in 2008, um, traveling for, through the Middle East, first tormenting the Pentagon for failing to equip American soldiers with body armor, and then mm. kind of writing critically about the war on terrorism. When I got in some trouble and I had to come back home and find something new to report about it, I kind of mentioned that because... A, I went from a situation where the Pentagon was kind of shifting responsibility from itself to the warriors in the field to a situation here where the government in kind of cahoots with big food was shifting responsibility for our health from themselves to us. And really it was like going from one war to another, because as you mentioned, I first started writing about contaminated food, salmonella, E. coli, in things like peanuts and hamburger, which was a huge revelation for me about this industry, either intentionally or unintentionally losing control over its food chain. And I was, I was continuing to write about contaminated food when one of my best sources who tests meat for the meat industry for E. coli said to me, you know, Michael, as, as tragic as these incidents of contamination are, you really should look at what my industry, he was talking about the processed food industry, is intentionally adding to its products over which it has absolute control. He was worried about all the salt going into processed meat products. And that got me looking also at sugar and then fats as this unholy trinity, if you will, in which this trillion dollar cartel-like industry relies on to get us to not just like their products, but to want more and more. Yeah. No, there's so much to unpack there. I mean, I actually got interested in microbiology years ago when I was a kid with some of these E. coli outbreaks um, in hamburger meat, because that just shocked me that you could have these types of, you know, really deadly bacteria in our foods. And a lot of it's coming from the way that these cattle are raised and these concentrated feedlots, they're covered in feces and then butchered in that way. And so there's a lot of the food industry is kind of hidden from the human, you know, view and again, staying with meat, if you if I go into the freezer section at my grocery store and look at packaged meatballs, there is actually, you know, corn syrup and salt yep. and all these other things that, you know, aren't meat. Um, so what's it been like to investigate this industry? Because there's a lot of money, as you mentioned, in this industry. Have you ever had pushback from the industry with this type of investigative reporting? 
I mean, actually got really, really lucky because as, as I sort of, you know, disclose in the document section of Salt, Sugar, Fat, the first book, mm -hmm. one of my biggest sources of info was, was from none other than the tobacco industry because mm -hmm. a lot of us kind of forgot that for years and years as things like obesity and diabetes were climbing in this country, the single largest manufacturer of processed food in North America was none other than the largest tobacco manufacturer, Philip Morris, right? Mm -hmm. Through its acquisition of the old company, General Foods, and then Kraft, and then Nabisco, right? And through the settlement that states had with the tobacco industry back in 1998, tobacco industry was required to disclose and dump millions of pages of documents. They're being archived, they're publicly available. But what a few people realize is that within all the tobacco documents, there were all these emails and white papers and strategy sessions and marketing plans um, between Philip Morris, the tobacco guys, and their food managers at Kraft. So when the inventor of Lunchables needed more money, he would fly to New York and, you know, and tell the tobacco guys all the things he was doing to figure out how to exploit kind of the needs of parents and kids in the lunchroom and creating the Lunchables. And a lot of this documentation was in this, you know, amazing trove of documents that I managed to, I was able to, because they were publicly available, search and get a hold of. And, and even more than that, it was, it was those documents that enabled me to identify key players in the industry. So I could just call them up and say, hey, I've got this email you wrote back in, you know, 2005, and it's really fascinating. Can I come see you and talk to you more? Because I really want the, I really want to know how you guys did it. How did you get us to trade, you know, a home cooked, scratch made, you know, um, vegetable stir fry or chicken pot pie for a hot pocket we'd eat walking down? The, I, how did you do that. And, you know, many of them sat down and talked to me and that became the essence of salt, sugar, fat is their documents and their people sort of telling me how they did it. Yeah. I think it's amazing within that, within that industry, you know, there's a lot of chemistry that goes into this. I mean, it's, it's, I guess the field is technically called food engineering, right? I think, and I talk to my students about this. A lot of people don't realize there's actually like very intentional chemistry and sociological studies that go into the design of these foods, which you explain beautifully yeah. Um, yeah. in your first book. Yeah. yeah. One of the big technicians at General Foods, which is this conglomerate that was based out of Terrytown at a huge kind of research facility. And he was a chemist out of World War II, and he gets a call one day from this company, General Foods, saying, how would you like to come work for us? He goes, I'm a chemist. And they go, that's okay. We're all about chemistry. We're not about like food stuffs. We're about chemistry here. We love you. Come work for us. And, and, that, and I think that, that goes a long way to understanding what we're talking about. And one of the frustrations sort of I have as a, just as a parent or somebody who cooks meals is, is that, this industry continues to be able to sort of sell its products as food when really they're food products. And the connection that many of these products have with real food and real stuff is, is very thin at, at best. Yeah. I mean, I, immediately as you're saying this, what comes to mind is like the cheese, cheese product, you know, the kind of very fake cheese that's not real cheese. My husband um, is from Italy. And so he's a very much a connoisseur of like real bread and real cheese. And I mean, when he first came to the U.S., he's like, where is the bread? You know, <laughs> like this, this aisle of all this processed bread It's like where, you know, bread shouldn't last that long. Cheese yeah, shouldn't look only, like that. <laughs> it's yeah, like, and not only that, but this sort of this industry has been on this, you know, rush to the bottom financially to make more and more money. And so even the people who invented cheese whiz for mm -hmm. craft ultimately became appalled by the product as, you know, efforts were made to reduce the cost of the ingredients going in the cheese whiz to the point where, you know, they no longer liked even processed cheese, right? So, so it's, it, it, it's been really interesting to see people, you know, people inside the industry become alarmed about either their culpability, you know, 
over our health, um, which I write about it in, in the book, because that's what's prompted this secret meeting back in 19, way back in 1999, mm. where a cabal of insider these companies get the CEOs of the biggest food companies in the world together to privately talk about their culpability in obesity and di type two diabetes and, and even some cancers and on and on. But some of the people in the companies even became appalled about this race to the bottom financially in these companies to make their products cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and more convenient to the, you know, to sacrificing even, even, even taste in their eyes, not to mention our good health. Yeah. I mean, I think this is really telling too, when you think about the costs that Americans pay in healthcare. I mean, we're one of the most expensive healthcare systems in the world. And yet across the board, we have some of the worst healthcare statistics when it comes to chronic disease and diabetes, obesity, heart disease. Um, you know, it's not for necessarily a lack of access to care. It's our life choices. But how much of it is really our choice? Uh, I wonder if you could talk about that. Yeah. So end of salt, sugar, fat. <clears throat> right. I try to end on a hopeful note. Something like, I mean, look, being a journalist, right? Information is power. Knowing what these companies are up to. I found even personally to be incredibly empowering. I can now walk in the grocery store and just kind of laugh knowing all the tricks and the schemes they use to get us to put those products in our shopping carts. And I sort of wrote that, you know, ultimately that will empower us to make better decisions about, you know, what to eat and how much to eat. And almost immediately when the book came out, I got a question, I think it was from British TV um, tabloid. Well, actually two questions. One, Michael, you know, Mr. Moss, have you been sued yet by these companies? <laughs> and, and then it was, Mr. Moss, you know, you say here that knowledge is power, but isn't this stuff you're writing about addictive like heroin? And if that's the case, how do we have any personal responsibility or ability to control it? And I thought, God, that sounds like the craziest thing in the world. You, you know, to compare Twinkies or Oreo cookies with crack cocaine just seemed absolutely ludicrous to me. Um, but the more I looked in it, the more fascinating it was. And that became then the basis of the, of the new book, Hooked, which is to look at that question, are in fact these products designed in a way that robs us of our free will, of our personal responsibility, of our ability to make decisions, mm -hmm. um, like addictive, other addicti addictive substances? Is it fair to call them addictive? Are there lessons we can learn from our dealings with other addictive substances that we can use going forward. And I have to say, as you know, having read the book, I came completely full circle on that question. And not only are many of these products for many people just as addictive as smoking and alcohol and some drugs, but in some ways, they're even more so and more problematic for us. Yeah. Well, I mean, and you you've you've written about these concepts of kind of mouthfeel and this bliss point that people reach when they're eating certain foods you know there's a reason why it's hard to put away that bag of chips because those chips have been engineered to hit on certain receptors that really stimulate your brain they dump some happy <laughs> happy endorphins in, into your system and it's it's really hard to to stop that behavior with that positive reinforcement system so do you did you come across any solutions? I mean, we have nicotine patches to wean people off of cigarettes. What do we do for people that are food addicted to some of these harmful products? Right. So one of the things you know about addiction is it happens on a spectrum. Mm -hmm. It affects some people much more than other people. And that's why, for example, when I sat down with the former head lawyer, general counsel of Philip Morris, he kind of jokingly told me that, look, Michael, I was one of those people who could smoke one cigarette a day in a business meeting, put the pack away and have no you know, impulse to pull the pack out again until the next business meeting the next day. But but I couldn't go near you know, a bag of our Oreo cookies, Philip Morris owned Nabisco at the time, mm -hmm. for fear of losing control and eating half the bag in, in one sitting. So. <laughs> So you have the you have the personal and, and for a journalist that's huge that sort of insider knowledge over the power of their products is 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 really really important to sort of know about. 
Um, so there are some people high on the spectrum Basically, the lesson from the world of addiction is if there are trigger foods in your, your life, you've got to do everything you can to avoid them. You just can't bring that bag of Oreo cookies or Hot Pockets or whatever it is that causes you to lose control into the house, or you will, in fact, lose, lose control of that. You know, somewhere in the middle of the spectrum are people who maybe get cravings for sugary things or other trigger foods in the middle of the afternoon like a cookie and one of the lessons from how we deal with other addictive substances is that when cravings hit you they're so strong and they fire up what scientists call the go part of the brain which is the the primitive part of the brain that gets us to do things um mm -hmm. so that the thinking part of the brain right typically up in front in the frontal cortex, where you go, hey, Michael, I'm not really sure it's such a great thing to be eating that whole bag of cookies right now at 3 p.m., right? Um, <laughs> that part goes to sleep. And these products are designed in a way to fire up the go brain in a way that puts the stop part of the brain, the, the, mm -hmm. the part of the brain that tells you to stop doing something that's not good for you, to sleep. Um, and so the lesson learned from addictive substances is that 3 p.m. craving comes along, no matter what your strategy is, because it's probably different for everybody, whether it's to get up and stretch or call a friend or try to eat something healthier that will stave off or, you know, avoid you eating the junk food, like a handful of nuts or whatever works for you. You need to be doing that in the case of the 3 p.m. cookie craving at like 2.45 in order to ward off the onset of the craving because once the craving hits you it's too late you're off and running and there's no reigning in the go part of your the go part of your brain and then kind of for everybody else kind of on that spectrum who maybe is just kind of missing the love and the ritual and the beauty of sitting around with home cooked meals with friends I mean, I think one of the big solutions out there, and I'm certainly not the first to say this, is just trying to do more cooking for yourself because it it magically does a lot of things for you. Um, I happen to think that speed is one of the elements in ultra processed foods that, that causes us to lose control. And cooking slows you down and slows down that process um, just enough to enable you to sort of stay in control of your eating habits. And, you know, and it doesn't always have to involve, you know, huge complicated recipes. I've got a recipe for tomato sauce down to 90 seconds now. And, <laughs> and, and granted, if it simmers on the stove for an hour, my family's more apt to eat it. But nonetheless, the point is, you can cook from scratch and not give up convenience, which is which is sort of one of the things that the industry sort of pretends to claim or claims or cl pretends to own claims that it owns and one of the things that's it's sold us so much on ultra processed foods is this notion that we need these companies and these products for convenience and it's just not true yeah and i i wonder you know with with shifts and work habits like we've never seen before during the pandemic people are spending more time at home and i'm wondering if there have been opportunities to try and cook more i mean um of the audience if if you're tuning in like reach out on on our social channels and let us know like are you trying more recipes i think one big difference between as you said a home cooked meal versus a processed meal is you know what goes into it right you may add a small you know pinch of salt but to your food but what's actually in those processed meals can have a huge amount of salt and, oh, so and other things yeah, yeah that tomato sauce i just mentioned i always put a pinch of sugar in it because my mom mm -hmm. was a great cook always yeah. put a pinch of sugar in it right and so I mean, that's the other thing to realize about this, this processed food industry is that they stole these things from us and corrupted them, right? So mm -hmm. nothing wrong with salt, sugar, fat in the hands of a cook. In the hands of the industry, they're using these ingredients not just for taste, but for preservatives, for the to keep their machinery lubricated on and on. They have all these other needs that we don't as as home cooks. I'll tell you another story about sugar too. So mm -hmm. salt, sugar, fat, I was able to meet, spend time with an icon in the industry named Howard Moskowitz, who invented the term the bliss point to describe mm -hmm. the perfect amount of sweetness in food that will 
send us over the moon and their products flying off the shelf. He was responsible for formulating many of the big products in the grocery store. He had a recent assignment from the soda company, Dr. Pepper, to invent a new flavor of Dr. Pepper. And he walked me through how he did it, which involved starting with no less than 60 different versions of a, the sweet new flavor, each one just slightly different than the next one, subjected those to taste tests like three or 4,000 around the country, took the data through into his computer, did his high math regression analysis thing, and out came these bell-shaped curved charts like kids get graded on in school, except at the top of the yeah. curve is not the dreaded middle C, it's the bliss point, not too little, not too much sugar. But here's the thing about sugar in the industry is that not only do they have people like Howard Moskowitz working for them, engineering perfect amounts of sweetness for soda, cookies, ice cream, whatever, they've marched to things we know should be sweet, right? And we should, we know we should be treating as a mm -hmm. treat. They marched around the grocery store, adding sugar to things that didn't used to be sweet engineering a bliss point for those. So bread came to have added sugar and a bliss point for sweetness. Some yogurts came to have as much sugar per serving as ice cream. Going back to spaghetti sauce, there were some brands in the spaghetti sauce aisle that had the equivalent of a couple of Oreo cookies worth of sweetness in a tiny half cup serving. And what that did arguably was sort of taught us to expect sweetness in everything we eat. And so when you drag yourself over to the produce aisle, right, or, or God help you, your kids, you're going to riot on your hands because they're going to yeah. be like, where's the sweet stuff, right? Their brain yeah. is rebelling. So that's, just, you know, it's just one example of the way the industry took something perfectly good, like sweetness, and, and, and used it in a way, exploited it in a way that, that caused us, causes us you know, incredible harm now. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm having like PTSD <laughs> memories of when my kids were little, um, going past the yogurt aisles because they have cartoons on them and they're right at kid height. If they're in the little, you know, in the cart, yeah. um, or if they're walking next to the cart, um, and looking at those ingredients, I mean, they added sugar from corn syrup, it would be like giving them, you know, candy bars, it's not healthy at all. And just the the fits they would throw without getting these extra extra sweet snacks. I mean, it's just, it sets up our kids for the, the wrong choices, I think later in life also, because you're getting so hooked at an early age to this high expectation of sugar. Yeah, absolutely. And then they took that yogurt and they put it in a little squeezable tube. So kids yes. have to, you know, use a spoon, put it in mm -hmm. a bowl, think about it. They could squeeze in one hand while they're, you know, while they're playing the video game in the other hand. And that I think is sort of key to understanding how we lost control because it's the, it's the engineered mindlessness in these products. I think that really got us that and the convenience, you know, and I mentioned speed, one of the hallmarks of addictive substances is that the faster the substance hits the brain, the more apt we are to act compulsively, impulsively in wanting more of that product. And so scientists who studied drugs began measuring how fast the drugs hit the brain. And I think, as I recall, tobacco smoke, for example, takes something like 10 seconds to fully engage the brain. Drugs or you know, alcohol, a few seconds, sort of less than that. But it turns out there's nothing faster than salt, sugar, fat. Because we're designed, and this is another really important thing here, we are designed by nature, by instinct, not just to love food, but to want to overeat food. And we can, we can remind me to talk about that because it's, it's huge. But anyway, yeah. but when you put a little dab of sugar, and they did this experiment of people, they sat them down and said, we want to measure how fast you take sugar compared to, say, tobacco. So when we put a little t you know, dab of sugar in your tongue, tell us when you taste it. So sugar goes to the tongue, gets picked up by the saliva, hits the taste buds. The sugar doesn't go directly to the brain. It sends a signal to the brain. And those people in the experiment were pushing the button saying they were tasting sweetness in less than one second. The signal was going to the brain and then down to their finger going, pew, right? And the same is true with salt, same is true with fats. Incredibly fast is our response. And, and so arguably in that way, speed, 
And, and when I looked at speed, I realized everything about the ultra processed food industry is about speed. You know, the faster they can make the product, the more money they make, the cheaper it is, the faster they make the packaging so you can open it and get your hand in and eat it, the more activated the brain is going to be. And of course, then the more they put the salt and the sugar and the fat sort of immediately available to you, um, the more excited the brain is going to get and, and, and act more impulsively. So when I think about ways to counter, to turn the tables in the food industry, it's, it's looking at ways to slow down our connection um, with, with food and our dealings with food as, as through cooking that we mentioned. Yeah, I mean, this this has kind of parallels with some of the concepts also from the slow food industry or the slow food movement should yeah. say, industry, right? Because it's all about, you know, slowing down to not only cook your own food, but also to enjoy it in company. I think that's something else that we've really shifted to over the past 50 years is, is, is moving towards, you know, eating quickly, um, but also in solitude. Yep. And and that's not great for our health either. Yep. No, the industry yeah. invented the term convenience foods, and they did it at a time when more women were going, you know, working, getting jobs outside of the home. This is after World War II, 1960s. Men mm -hmm. didn't step up and take, oh, you know, their share of the cooking responsibilities. So, they, you know, these food companies came in and said, don't worry, we'll take it over for We will make dinner for you. Um, so they coined that term convenience foods and we fell for it. And there, you know, as you mentioned, there is just this huge hidden cost in convenience. I would like to call these things fast groceries, actually, um, like fast food and in, in, in drive in restaurants. Um, you know, the hidden cost and sort of fast groceries and convenience foods has been our, our, our health and losing control of our eating habits. Yeah. Well, and going back to what you mentioned at the beginning of, of our discussion around the involvement of the government, I mean, I think it's also important to note that there's a reason that these foods are not only not, it's not only about the convenience, it's also about the cost and how their costs are actually artificially lowered based on subsidies that our government pays for, you know, um, through mechanisms like the farm bill um, that keep products like corn artificially low that allows for all these, you know, processed ingredients to be produced at a very, very cheap rate. Um, mm -hmm. So do you, do you, what are your thoughts about that? I mean, what is the responsibility of the government to, to address this? Yeah. I mean, I was actually really shocked when I was, I, I did a story for the New York times on, on marketing broccoli. And I, you know, it was, it was really fun yeah. to get this Madison Avenue type company which worked for junk food companies normally to do a pro bono advertising campaign for the yeah, company. That's great. They were so cute because it was like the hardest thing they ever did, right? It's so easy to sell, you know, soda to kids, but broccoli. But in the course <laughs> of reporting that, I didn't know this, but 90% of the acreage in this country is planted in soybeans and field corn, which is not the corn that you eat on the cob, it's the stuff that goes into high fructose corn syrup and ethanol and, and animal mm -hmm. feed. Um, and the, the, those are the foodstuffs of the processed food industry. And much of the, much of the reason why processed food is, is, is inexpensive is that the, those big agriculture companies put enormous amount of research and investment into lowering the cost of soybeans and field corn, along with sort of government subsidies. At any rate, 90% for that, the entire rest of our food needs, all the stuff we should be eating more of, produce and nuts and fruits and vegetables, you know, has the, the other 10% with almost no investment by industry and government in making those things um, more affordable, yummier, more available year round, et cetera. So that was kind of the one of the big lessons. Um, the real shocking thing for me with the government though, is that in so many ways, these companies or the government agencies, I should say, which are supposedly there to regulate these companies on our behalf. Mm -hmm. In fact, the companies are more powerful than the government agencies and the, and the agencies defer to them. These, these companies are, have, you know, have huge political financial clout. I mean, look at the Obama administration. Hats off to Michelle Obama for making 
food part of the national conversation, right? Mm -hmm. But when she turned to her husband and, and they talked about ways to crack down on the industry, right? All yeah. companies had to do was say, do you know how many millions of jobs you're like messing with here? Um, so even that administration, which had that opportunity and the, and the, and the drive and the, the smarts to you know, help us rethink our products was intimidated by the political and the financial power of the processed food industry. And so, so I think those are, the, those are the key things to think about in terms of solutions is, can we really expect, you know, the current, even the current administration to sort of take, you know, take a more aggressive approach to, to, to reining in big food in a way that helps us. And I, I'm afraid, I think the answer is no, we can't expect that. I think that, I think the yeah. answer is gonna lie in us, you know, being able to move the industry by convincing them that they can still make money by selling us products that are, you know, in, you know, affordable, convenient, but but also and yummy, but 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 good for us as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, the other thing that's kind of happened during the pandemic is, you know, the global supply chain backups and issues. A lot of our foods, as you mentioned, are imported um, other than these kind of processed foods. And it, it seems to me like it would almost be considered a, a national security issue. The fact that we don't have a lot of our foods produced in-house um, in the United States. But I don't think that the government quite sees it that way um, because it's been so easy to bring in cheap foods from outside well, the, the uh, government's always been worried about the price of food. You go back to the Nixon yeah. for that. And so that that is a huge thing, right? Mm -hmm. if, if the cost of packaged foods in the grocery stores goes up enough, there will be political consequences for that. Okay. So, so they're worried about this. But, but going back to the pandemic, one of the things that was so surprising was that, yes, many of us began cooking more remember sourdough was like a thing yeah you could you couldn't find you couldn't find flat bread flour anywhere well, in the okay, right so yeah so when we went shopping immediately yeast and flour ran out right but mm -hmm. you notice how like the cookie aisle stayed full of stuff so one of the tricks that the companies use is that they sent the drivers of their trucks into the grocery stores stocking the shelves themselves. There was no supply chain problem for all the junk food in the grocery store, whereas the stuff that we wanted and needed. But here's the other interesting thing that happened um, during the pandemic, because in so many ways, these companies have figured out how to make products that tap into our emotions. And one of the most powerful addictive aspects of food besides speed is memory. All of us have food memories starting at a really early age in life. And we hold those memories for the rest of our life. I went into a research and development factory of Kellogg's not long ago, where they were experimenting with various things, including a big batch of Pop-Tarts and it had screwed up and they were dumping the raw dough into a big bin to dispose of it. And the aroma came wafting across the factory floor and instantly took me back to my grammar school age where I was a latchkey kid and I'd come home from school, um, open up the door and put a strawberry Pop-Tart in the, in the toaster. I hadn't had a Pop-Tart since then. <laughs> Smelling that aroma decades later took me instantly back because the memory of those Pop-Tarts had never left my head. So what happened in the pandemic? Under the stress and the strain of COVID, we went grocery shopping and we started buying junk that we hadn't had since we were kids. Sales of those items, much to the joy of the food companies, soared. We ended up turning, well, we thought we were going to get away from the most treacherous corner of like the processed food industry, the vending machine at work, right? But many of us ended up turning our kitchen cupboards into vending machines, bringing all this stuff home. And so that, yeah. that's another powerful way that, the, that, I, that I argue that many of these food products are even more problematic for us than tobacco, alcohol, drugs, is the, is the power of food memories to, to get us to, to, to act on, on food desires and, and get us to lose control. Wow. So 
Mm. Given all of these forces, what advice do you have for for people that you know are going to the grocery store are looking for better choices? Like, how do we navigate these landmines? Um, right. So I know because we're coming up. Really- Coming up to the diet season, right? I mean, you know, mm-hmm. January 2nd, we're going to get on the scale. And, you know, there may be a few pounds from the holidays. there may be more than a few pounds from the pandemic. One of the most important things to realize is it's really, really hard to lose weight. I'll tell you just one aspect of that. It turns out that body fat, and I didn't know this until I spent time with scientists who study our endocrinology, Body fat is a living, thinking, diabolical organ that communicates with the rest of the body. And its sole purpose in life is to prevent you from screwing around with it. So that if you're trying to lose weight, body fat is sending a signal to the brain telling you you're hungry when you're really not hungry. And not only that, but it will slow down your resting metabolism so that you're burning more, you're burning less energy. And so you're less of a threat when you're just kind of like sitting around or sleeping or what have you. Um, And it makes perfectly sense because remember, I asked you to remind you, one of the things that really got me in reporting Hooked was that these companies are tapping into basic instincts that we have to like food, to want food, and to overeat because for much of our previous existence, overeating was a really good thing. It enabled our brains to grow. It enabled us to get through hard times, enabled us to have more babies, right? What's happened is that more than us being addicted to food is that these companies have so dramatically changed the nature of our food um, in a way that's made overeating an everyday thing. And so now dial forward to what you can do when you have weight gain. The first thing is to be realistic and know, how hard it's going to be to lose that weight if, 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 if in fact that's your that's your goal. Um, and so and the other thing too is to realize it's really difficult to just switch over to a radical diet. They work until they yeah. don't. And you know and the media is culpable for this and sort of selling us on you know one new diet after another. So some of the best advice I've heard from people is go really slow. I mean pick one thing to tackle. And don't worry about everything else for a while. And maybe it's sugary drinks, for example. Yeah. Try to sort of eliminate those in your life and try to stick with that for a week or two and see how it goes. Um, and then speaking of sugary drinks, again, one of the one of the things I think that can empower us is realizing that this industry stole things from us. And so speaking of sugary drinks, before there was soda, <clears throat> there was plain soda. Even a town in Jersey called Seltzer, where the populace has sat around for centuries debating the merits of natural spring water over another, because, and scientists are just kind of realizing this, bubbles, effervescence, right, is incredibly exciting to the brain, almost as much as sugar, right? And we don't quite know how we even taste bubbles or how that signal goes, to the, but it does, and we love bubbles. And so if you've got kids in the house, might be in a position to stop buying the sugary soda and shift them over to plain bubbly water, maybe add a little bit of, you know, that's, you know, lemon spritz or whatever. I know because my teenage kid was able to do it. And he now loves plain soda water, bubbly water, I think even more than soda, than than sugary, than sugary soda. Um, But it does take time. So start with one thing. Be patient. Um, You've developed a lifetime of bad eating habits, and you can't expect to turn that corner in a week or a month. It's going to take a year, perhaps, to really sort of change over, because what you're doing is carving new memory channels in your brain Mm -hmm. for the good foods. You're trying to develop good habits, and and that takes a while. So don't try to do too much. Be patient. And look for ways to retake what the industry stole from us and in, in regaining control of your own eating habits. That's great. That's tremendous advice. And I think the perfect season for it, as you said, um, as we try and make a turn for, for a healthier year. 
Well, this has been amazing, Michael. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And to all of the um, listeners out there, be sure to get his latest book called Hooked. And you can also find uh, more information on his books at his website at www.mossbooks.us. It's been awesome speaking with you. I mean, it, your your work is is so important and has really shed a lot of light on what's, you know, otherwise been a kind of very hidden industry. So thank you for that. Thank you. And thanks to you for your incredibly important work. It's, it's amazing. So thank you. Thank you. Great. You've been listening to Foodie Pharmacology, the science podcast for the food curious. Um, I want to give a shout out of thanks to our producers, to Christine Roth and Rob Cohen. And thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in each week. You can catch this and all of our other episodes at foodiepharmacology.com. You can also find the video versions of our episodes on the Teach Ethnobotany YouTube channel. Thanks so much for listening. Stay healthy out there, and I'll see you next time.